1986 was when Master of Puppets came out, and then they went out and did that Aussie tour. was when they went from being a, a really amazing underground club band to being a band that could go out and play arenas. It was unbelievable to be sitting there with Ozzy every night playing to 15,000 people. I'm there, Coliseum. The place was packed. I'm looking around and they all had Metallica shirts on. Everybody was headbanging, and somebody tore off the seat cushion off their seat, and they threw it at the stage. And so everybody started doing it. It looked like piranhas attacking a ham, you know what I mean? I've been to a, probably a couple hundred concerts, and this is the only concert I was ever scared at. And when it was time for them to leave, to get off the stage, everybody kept chanting. This is the Ozzy concert, right? Like, Ozzy's definitely coming on. They were blowing Ozzy off the stage. I mean, they were just a, a monster band. We were out to take over the heavy metal scene. We were just having fun. You never actually got a chance to think that there was anything else that could be. We were with Ozzy in the States till late May, and then Europe after that. We till next year, and yeah, we're pretty much on the road. <laughs> It was a night like most of the rest of them on that tour. Play a show, hang out, drink, and, and stumble onto the bus. That night, we were in Sweden. Uh, we were on our way to Denmark for a show. Me and Cliff were the last two people up. I went to bed before he did. The next thing that happened was, I just remember hearing these loud noises. It wasn't an earthquake, it was the back wheels of the bus jumping. The bus flipped and, and was rolling. And I thought, oh my god, we're going off a cliff or something. The bus, you know, went over on a side, you know, and I kicked out the back window, which is the emergency window. I don't know what it was, 15 degree weather outside. You know, we're all in our underwear. I just started freaking out. And I just knew instantly that uh, something was horribly wrong. I could hear everyone else screaming and crying, but I didn't hear Cliff's voice. But it was all kind of odd because we were standing there going like, where's Cliff? and turn around, I could see, I could see Cliff's feet sticking out from underneath the bus. There's no movement, there's no nothing. And that was just something that I'll never forget. The vision is just, it, it's burnt into my mind. It took days and weeks to even, to even to be able to just understand that that had gone down. You know, it's one of those things you relive over and over. You think so much about and you try and change it in your mind. It was so surreal because death and mortality, it, that was not part of the gig, you know what I mean? I felt like an orphan, you know? It felt like I lost, you know, an older brother. It was so sad that he was taken at such a young age. Shortly after his funeral, we all decided Cliff would be the last one to say, you know, let's give up. That would have pissed him off, you know, immensely. We had to keep going because it was the only thing we knew. We talked about it and we wanted to keep the spirit of Cliff Burton alive and well in Metallica. And to stop Metallica would just stop that, that spirit. Coming up. Metallica fills the void. This is the new f***er right here. Mr. Dixon, new kid on bass guitar. They hazed the hell out of that guy. It was far from easy. And later, group therapy. The higher we ascend, the more challenging it will be. We were all off in our own little childish worlds, so we needed that help. Next on When Metallica Ruled the World. In the fall of 86, Cliff died. And as horrible of an experience of losing your best friend, um, there was no way the band wasn't going to go on. It was always had, you know, fighting attitude, because we know Cliff would want it that way. We just jumped in and started auditioning, calling around, checking in with people like Brian Slagle. And I said, well, I think I have the guy for you, Jason Newstead. Of course, his favorite band in the world is Metallica. When I went in for my audition, I'm like, oh, holy crap. 
I know every song that they've played and worship them and all that thing. He was incredibly talented. In the end, we just realized that Jason was the right guy. 11 days after I was asked to be in Metallica, we were touring Japan. This is the new f right here, Mr. Jason, new kid on Beastie It was like Cliff wasn't there, and it, it was tough. And the way that we coped with that was to take that out on Jason. They hazed the hell out of that guy. It's Jason's f birthday today. Let's kill him. We would always go drinking, all of us, without him. And then we would, of course, charge the whole evening's festivities to his room. We love you, Jason. <laughs> Honest. <laughs> we would tell him things like, you know that mini bar in your hotel room? It's all free, Jason, so let's drink it. And I didn't know that it cost money. Dude, they're in your room, you know? We weren't very nice at all. Hey, hey, let's go. No matter if this band goes for 20 more years, you know, I'm always going to be the new guy no matter what. With the release of Vengeance for All in 89, Metallica finally made a decision to make a video. Here's Metallica with their first video ever. This is called One. At that time, videos on MTV were all just kind of cheesy and corny. Now that the war is through with me. We were more into portraying ourselves in a different light. Television had the power to show the people what Metallica looked like and sounded like and make it almost a household name. When the one video came out, it exposed millions of new people to Metallica. They were on the brink of, if you haven't heard of us, guess what? You will. Me and James wrote what became the Black Album in probably about three months or so over the summer of 1990. It was a constant battle between Lars and I. Do you want to hear it with vocals? I Go sing it. One verse and one chorus. All I have. You know, we'd be fighting over ridiculous things that didn't matter. We'll fight for hours over it. The vocal line goes exactly with the guitar. But the, the conflict and just the static created this electricity that uh, we were hitting a new peak in everything. When that album started taking shape, it was just like one great song after another. From a production and songwriting point of view, it was a departure from all the albums they had done songs that were a bit different, a bit more melodic, a little more personal. It was an amazing record, and it kind of had the feeling of keeping their old fans happy, but also kind of crossing the boundaries into new stuff. Black Album was released in August of 1991. The metal world was lined up in the streets in the middle of the morning, waiting for a record store to open. The Black Album came out, debuted number one, and it was just a combination of, you know, an amazing album, the right time, the planets just all aligned themselves properly. You guys expecting your album to do what it did? Or were you no. blown away? No, actually, I was expecting it to do a lot better. <laughs> Every month, I'd get a phone call. Yeah, we just passed the four million mark, and a month later, the five million mark, a month later, the six million mark, and the record just kept going and going. After like the third or fourth single, I just thought, when's it gonna stop? But it never really stopped. It was craziness. That was really the time where you thought, okay, this band is the biggest band in the world, because everywhere you went, you heard Metallica. We were just totally saturating airwaves. 40-minute music marathon, enter Sandman from Metallica. If it wasn't the airwaves, it was, you know, the TV waves. <laughs> 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 if it wasn't the TV waves, it was like the media. We were on front covers of magazines, and it was just everywhere. You had people in Russia, you had people in China. There's people on satellites jamming to Metallica. Remember one time, dude sends a video. It comes on the screen, and you're inside the cockpit of a spacecraft. 
and you see these dudes come floating into the picture, right? And you hear music come on, and it's Metallica. And he takes his hands, and his hands come up, and he's got Dan Justice in one hand, and he's got the black album, and he goes... Whoa. them they're they're my favorite band we started noticing that there would be many more females showing up at the gigs a lot of chicks looks like 50 50 that's the sign of making it we got to a point where we would tell our tour manager when we go off stage we want you guys to have the showers running and girls in there ready and willing to bathe us. They became known as tub tarts. The guys on the crew would go out and ask young, willing females if they're, they're you know, willing. The opening line would be, would you mind getting your hair wet? We'd get off stage, hop in the shower, and voila, there'd be like, you know, a girl in there, sometimes two, sometimes 14. Whoever was in the shower last, I would get the not-so-good-looking ones, you know. I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't pretty fun. Might sound stupid, but uh, how many in here don't have the new album? The Black Album was giant, and we went everywhere and anywhere. We were on the road for two years, and I think did somewhere in the vicinity of about 250 shows. The band set out to play every market that they possibly could, and, th and that was worldwide. Moscow, we're having some fun today! You know, we'd finish a leg on the tour, and I remember our manager would come out, hey guys, guess what? We gotta go back to Japan. The Wherever I May Roam single has gone through the sushi house roof or something, you know. It's, it's, we gotta go back there. When a record's got those kind of legs on it, you gotta go out there and, and just try and, and hold on. We were out on tour one evening in August 92 in Montreal. We go out there and play our set. Everything's fine, you know, the audience is, is grooving. During the song Fade to Black, I moved for some reason. I was right over a canister that would shoot up a 12-foot chemical flame. I just wanted to do that. All the strings melted off the guitar instantly. I mean, it was the most horrific pain. I was like, holy f I can't believe it. I can't believe this is happening. Half my hair was gone. Half my mustache and beard was gone. Half my skin on my arm was gone. I can visibly see the skin rising off the back of his hand. Once we got to the emergency room, James was already talking about how we could continue the tour. The Metallica attitude is, OK, that happened, but that's not going to stop me from doing this. James would not be able to play guitar for quite a while, but he could continue singing. So we got another guitar player, and we were up and running again within, like, you know, two and a half weeks. Bang, they came right back. Dun, 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 dun. Metallica. you know, some other band. It was far from easy, but we were determined to kick people's ass, and we did. We knew that that ride was only gonna come by once, so we grabbed it and definitely had fun with it. You get one chance for a phenomenon, and that was our phenomenon. Coming up, Metallica falls apart. He left the band. He left the band. <laughs> Next on When Metallica Ruled the World. After the Black Album tour of almost three years, I could not believe that it was over. We'll see you around soon, I hope.